Okay, well, we've got a very small but very motivated class this evening. And so, <laughs> uh, well, we're still in Genesis and we're still in Isaac's family as we're seeing God's covenant carried out, the covenant he made with Abraham. As we watch this, we remember in the last chapter last week, it ended up where Esau married a couple different foreign women. He married one of Ishmael's daughters and married some other, you know, uh, lady. And uh, let me see, where where did it say she was from? It said, then Esau was 40 years old. He took Judith, the daughter of Bere, the Hittite, so a Hittite to be his wife, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. So he married two Hittite women, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah, is what it says. So I was talking about a dysfunctional family. Remember, I was saying, hey, if you think that dysfunctional families have only happened now, no, it was happening all the way back then, too. And so we see that uh, we know Esau's already sold his birthright to Jacob just for some food. You know, he said, oh, man, I've gotten back from working in the field. I'm tired. You know, I'm about to die. Give me some of your lentil stew. So, of course, Jacob says, all right. <laughs> Hey, I'll hook you up with some food if you give me that birthright. Uh huh. Let's just make a pact and an oath, and uh, I'll, I'll let you eat. Man. Hey, this is really good stuff, by the way. You you don't know how good this lentil soup is. So we see that Esau, he could have cared less. Obviously, to him, the birthright wasn't that important because who would give up a birthright for a bowl of soup? You know, I mean, he, he would have survived. You know, the issue is, what's up with that? But what I was saying is that we see that what God had revealed to Rebecca when she said the older will serve the younger, we're already seeing that, uh, you know, happen. And we're going to see more that happens now. And this is basically the last nail that puts, you know, the lid on the coffin of Esau's uh, place within the Abrahamic covenant. Esau's not going to be part of that Abrahamic covenant. He will still be a son of Abraham. Don't get me wrong. And that's no small thing, you know, because, I mean, God loves, you know, Abraham, really loved Abraham. He selected him to be the father of the nation that he was going to be the god of and so through that whole covenant i mean look at what he did with ishmael ishmael wasn't the covenant son but even so god had him you know be a, a prosperous set of nations under him unfortunate for the jews because one of the prophecies that god gave to hagar was that they would be against each other you know, Ishmael would be against his, the other part of his family. In other words, Isaac's family. They would be confrontation. And we see that today. What's going on out there today is because of Abraham's other children, not just Ishmael alone, but the six sons that he had with, with uh, Keturah. You know, so when we see that even after Sarah died, Abraham apparently was still quite strong and able married this other woman called Keturah, and she was from the east, probably where he came from originally, probably down in the Chaldees, the Ur of the Chaldees, remember that's where he came up from? She was from that area. But before Abraham died, he didn't want these six sons competing with Isaac because he knew that the arrangement that God had made with him through the covenant was for Isaac, period. Okay, so... That's why he gave them gifts and basically sent her back to her nation with her sons. And where did they populate? They populated all of that area of Iraq, Iran, probably Pakistan, uh, the upper parts of um, Afghanistan, all those areas that surround the southern part, probably Arabia, um, and probably over into Africa, 
they populated that area. Ishmael's sons populated up around Israel. You know, so just on the southern side of Israel, on the uh, southwestern side, on the western side, they populated all the way from the Wadi of Egypt, which is on that side of the Nile, all the way over on the south side of the Canaanite land and up over into Syria and up that way. So that included Lebanon. So basically, Israel, the part of land that God was promising to Abraham and then to Isaac, was surrounded by all of these other nations that were also descendants of Abraham. And that's where a big amount of consternation exists. Because guess what? All of those nations claim Abraham as their father. And they're not wrong. But see, they they want to be the one who received the birthright, the sons of promise, as it were, from Abraham. And so they don't want Israel in there taking away their glory, so to speak. So you can understand, even though they don't talk about Abraham these days much, unless it has to do with Jerusalem or one of those areas already within the part that is Israel's land, uh, you hear them talking more about their beliefs on the Muslim side. And on the Muslim side, the radicals still believe they need to take out Israel. They, because, I mean, it was the Quran was written around 500 AD. Um, and so when we look at that, that was written by Muhammad, one that they hold up as a significant prophet. And supposedly an angel came to him and told him what to write. And in there, there's a surah, what we would call a chapter. And... In that surah, it speaks that uh, de there should, I mean, it, those who are infidels should die. And what he's talking about, it depends how you interpret. It's just like our Bible. It's, aren't there a lot of interpretations in our Bible that you may say, well, I'm not so sure that's what the Bible's saying. But people interpret it. And in some cases, we've even seen Christians go out and want to kill people like at abortion clinics or something like that. You know, you've seen that happen, or at least they claim to be Christian. And they felt that they're doing God's mandate by going out and taking out those people that are doing the sinful work. Well, so it shows that you can get radicals anywhere within a, a spiritual standing or a spiritual belief. Well, in the Muslim side, that's what they believe. They believe that the way Muhammad wrote it wasn't a matter of just, you know, being metaphorical in the sense that, you know, hey, we have to be passionate about going and spreading the Muslim religion. Instead, they said, we need to be passionate about going and taking out anyone who does not claim to be Muslim, period. And so, but see, they have to start with Israel because Israel's got the blessing and they don't want Israel to have the blessing that's theirs. And so in a sense, that's why they see Israel as the small Satan. <laughs> Guess what? We get the honor of being the great Satan, okay? We the Americans. So when you look at this whole issue, it all starts back then. It all starts back in the Abraham time. I mean, everything that we're seeing today, in a sense, was prophesied. You know, when Jesus talked to, hey, I mean, Jesus, when God, in essence, it was Jesus, a pre-incarnate manifestation of the son. When he talked to Hagar, that's exactly what he said, that there was going to be antagonism between Ishmael's children and the son of promise children there was going to be that infighting going on. And so it's been going on all along. It hasn't stopped, you know, and it's kind of like what we were talking about earlier, Janice, when we were talking about the birth pains in the world that Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24. And in a sense, you see, they come after Israel and then it backs off. Like, if you think about it, the Six-Day War was back, what, back back in 67 or 69, somewhere in the 60s, I think. And uh, now they've been a nation since the 40s, but, you know, they still had Arabic nations coming after. Them. And now, ever since that, 
they've had these other organizations pop up that are groups made up of the radical Muslim individuals from all these Arabic nations. So it's hard to pinpoint. It's not like the United Nations can say, hey, we need to put sanctions against Iran or against Iraq or against Yemen or against you know, Lebanon or against any of these other nations, because it's not any one nation that is collectively as a nation coming after Israel. It's just certain radical elements within those nations that come and make up these groups like Hezbollah, Hamas, ISIS. And I just heard that there's another one coming out of Yemen that's one of these just like Hamas. Um, and, and there are others. But, you know, they're not as known, well known as these others that have been in the news more recently. So that's how the nations kind of stay clear of being pinpointed for specific action against their nations because they say, hey, it's not us. But yet we can see like Iran is very functional in providing support to these groups, training, weapons, um, uh, and, and the theology for the radicalism that they have. I mean, it all, a, a lot of it comes out of Iran and that's the way he pushes. It. So when we look at all of this, we realize it, it, it is exactly what God said was gonna happen. And the antagonism is there. And it'll probably grow just by virtue of the fact that that's part of what the whole Abrahamic covenant was about. I mean, not that the Abrahamic covenant was saying, hey, you're going to get, you know, run over by all these people. But what we see, if you go even further into Deuteronomy, um, you know, maybe chapters 18 through 26, something like that. God taught, you know, tells them, the Jewish people, if you follow me, and then he gives this long list of what he's going to do for you. And it's all good stuff. I mean, even to the point of their crops growing well, their harvest going well, uh, uh, they will be uh, the head and not the tail. You know, I mean, they will be influential throughout the whole world. And God is just going to bless them if they continue to follow him. But then uh, after he changes position, uh, he says, but if you don't follow me, then, man, there is a double long list of uh, compared to the one that he gave of all the good things he'd do if they did follow him. And in this one, man, he talks about they're going to go through a lot of problems in the world. They're going to have nations come in. They're going to have nations conquer them. They're going to have nations come in and subject them. They're going to have nations come in, you know, and be problematic to them, take away all their food. And he said, but and even if it gets real bad, you're going to go into exile. And that's what we saw, right? We saw that in um, in the time of uh, like Jeremiah. Jeremiah was the last one that was predicting that they were going into exile. Okay, this was Judah now. This wasn't the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom went into exile uh, like, and some of the minor prophets were warning them and they went in a little over 100 years before Judah did. And so when you look at it, like Janice had just gone through Jeremiah, I mean, there were warnings all along that Jeremiah was giving Israel saying, dude, you got to come back to the Lord because, hey, you don't want what's coming. But let me tell you what's coming. And then, of course, they just poo pooed him and said, nah, ain't going to happen. And then he warned this one group right about the time that they had the first invasion from Babylon and told them, don't go to Egypt. You don't want to go to Egypt. If you go there, you'll surely die there. And they said, well, seek the Lord and tell us about that. Let's let, just check it out for us. And he came back and he said, yep, God said, the Lord God said, don't go to Egypt. If you go there, you will surely die. And what they said, ah, baloney, you know, we're going to Egypt. And they took him with them, <laughs> took him to Egypt with them. It's like, what's up with you guys, man? You don't listen. Why do you even ask to hear the word of the Lord if you're not going to pay attention anyway? So, I mean, when you look at that, you see that when they don't obey God, Israel goes through bloody noses. But one of the things you see throughout the Old Testament 
and it applies just as much today, is that no matter how much God allows them to get bloody noses along the way, he says, but I will always keep a remnant. And he says, I will. And one of the things he talks about is I will always bring you back to the land. In other words, hey, you know, I may have you off in the exile, but I'm going to bring you back. And we see that happening today. You know that there are Christian organizations out there, and I'm sure that there are uh, other organizations that are helping Jews come back to Israel. I, I know I've sent some money to them, not a lot, but, you know, to help, you know, bring Jews back from around the world that want to come back home. Because it's, it's fulfilling a prophecy that was given that the Jews are going to come back to the land. Now, obviously, it's not going to be every single Jew. And the other thing is, the Jews that come back are not going to even be close to pure bloods. You know, I mean, they're going to be a, a, a piece, so to speak, genetically of the Jewish blood, the Jewish race. And who knows? Maybe all three of us may have a bit of Jewish you know, descendancy in us, even though we don't know it, you know, I mean, maybe a small part, who knows, but I mean, what you see is that, you know, God's going to bring them back to the land, that's part of his promise to the Jewish people, and we see that being fulfilled today, and one of the things that you see also about Israel is that in the covenant that God made with Abraham that we already studied, we see that God told him the land that he's going to give. Now, we as Americans have been there mostly to back Israel. But we've tried to intervene and provide negotiating strength, whether through the UN or through other organizations, to try to bring peace between the Palestinians and the Jewish nation. Now, the question is this, is Palestine an official country? No. No, they aren't. They're, they are a group of people that have, basically, they're like the makeup of some of these people, you know, the Muslims, that have come into the land and they want to have a presence. But what you find is that a lot of these uh, disparate organizations that are against Israel are in this Palestinian organization, as it were. And we've been trying to help them keep the peace by negotiating with this group, not a nation, but this group, to try to maintain peace. And what we've ended up doing in the negotiating is having Israel give them, you know, the West Bank. And the West Bank is like, a third of Israel's land. And that's and those are all, you know, Palestinian folks, you know, Muslims, uh, Muslim people. And the Gaza Strip is also another place that's been allocated to the Palestinians as part of a peaceful agreement between Israel and Palestine that we have brokered. Now, I'm not so sure that that was the right thing to do, but it's been done, okay? And where did these Hamas individuals come through to do this latest killing? They came through the West Bank. And by, in essence, what was supposed to be a peace token to the Palestinians was used as a vehicle to come in and massacre some Jewish people. And that's what started this whole hoopla that's going on right now. Well, and we also have to understand that in that Gaza Strip, there's a whole bunch of tunnels under that land. So a lot of time, a lot of the question becomes, why are the Jewish people so strong, the Jewish military, against this Gaza thing? It's because they have thousands of missiles underground under that Gaza in those tunnels, and they can move those missiles and shoot them from different positions throughout that whole Gaza Strip. And so, you know, you would say, why then why doesn't, you know, Israel just bomb them and leave it? Because it, those, those tunnels will probably survive bombs. But that's why they have to get the manpower in there, the invasion force, because they have to go in there 
And I mean, it's not the best kind of warfare you want fighting in tunnels. You know, I mean, we did it in Cambodia and against the Viet Cong. And I'll tell you, we had a lot of losses going into, you know, underground tunnels and things like that. But that they have to do it if they're going to clear out all that ammunition and stuff that have come in illicitly from Iran. And that's what they're shooting into Israel. So, and what they do is they shoot them. They have these areas that are around schools, around hospitals and whatnot, where they can come up out of those tunnels and shoot these missiles. And that's why the, the world is so on the side of the Palestinians saying, why are the Jews killing innocent people? Well, the issue is, is if that's where the weapons are coming from and they're killing Jews, wouldn't you say the Jews need to defend themselves? And yeah, I'm sorry that people, some of the people aren't the radicals that are in there. But hey, war is war and a nation has to defend itself. I mean, if they did, if somebody did that to us, would we just stand by and not shoot anything back? Like, no, everything's fine. <laughs> hey, we can take a bloody nose. No, of course not. We would respond in kind as well. But for some, well, they're also telling the Palestinians to leave if you they want to, but most of them aren't leaving. So nope. they're all in it together. So oh yeah, yeah. That's to me, why I, I'm thinking. Well, just bomb them. You know, they're not innocent. They're not killing innocent all the innocent people because most of them aren't. Right. Yeah, but what's sad when you watch? All, them, yeah. All, I hear you. But what's sad is when you watch the news, they don't show the babies and the kids and all that on Israel's side that are getting, you know, killed and bombed out. What they show is the ones in Gaza. And then the question is, were those real or those fabricated? Because, hey, one of the things we know about the strategy of these groups is that they know how to present a front that looks like they're being the persecuted ones. And mm -hmm. that, oh man, you know, oh, we're the one. But then when somebody comes up with an issue like just recently about a peace negotiation, they say, no peace, forget peace. We're not going for peace. Well, then no peace means war. So, hey, but the only reason I bring all this up is because I just want to tie that together with exactly what had been prophesied back, you know, in Abraham and Sarah's day when the Lord spoke to Hagar. I mean, there is that antagonism in the family because, hey, they are family extended as they may be. They are still family. And we're seeing that that is what is happening. So some would say, well, we Americans aren't part of that family. Yeah, no, but we're backing Israel. You know, that doesn't make us, you know, uh, a bad guy. It just means that we're in support of what we believe. And hopefully we still stick with our Judeo-Christian background. Notice I put Judeo in there because that's where uh, Jesus came, right? He came from the province of Judah. You know, well, he was born in Nazareth. I mean, he was raised in Nazareth, but he was born in Bethlehem. So when you look at Judah being central, our, our beliefs are, you know, we also, as for those who are Christians, we know that we've been adopted into the Abrahamic family, Abrahamic line. And that was part of the covenant that God told Abraham was going to be, was that he was going to have a, a offspring of, you know, as the sand of the seashore and the stars in the sky. But also what he said, even though he told him about this offspring, why did he rename him from Abram to Abraham? And what was the difference? What did Abraham mean? Remember, it meant the father of many nations. You know, Abram was just basically like the father of you know, a good father, so to speak. Right. But when he made him Abraham, he became the father of many nations. And you would think, well, wait a minute. Why would God make Abraham the father of many nations when he had basically chosen him to be the father of 
these this Jewish people through the son of promise, which is Isaac, right? So we see that God had bigger plans. Abraham couldn't see them all, but we know that through Jesus Christ now, any believers that come into Christ are part of the Abrahamic line because we become adopted into God's family, which is Abraham's family in the sense, through the covenant. So, so as you look at this, you realize, wow, there's a bigger picture to what is going on all the way back here in Genesis as to what is occurring in the world today over in the Middle East, you know, with Israel and everybody else that's jumping into the fray. And if they're not jumping into the fray actively, they sure are doing it through rhetoric. You know, you hear all these nations either, oh, I'm behind Hamas or, oh, I'm behind Israel or, you know, it's like nobody's talking about what can we do to make this go away, to help each other, how to make it. It's <laughs> It's like they're already choosing sides as to who's going to do what to whom. And it's like, Lord, have mercy. So the only reason I bring all this up in the introduction is because we need to see that the Bible has veracity and was applicable then just as much as it is today. And we see these things happening. You know, I mean, the prophecies are clear. And so we're going to pick up now and we're going to look at where uh, we're going to have another family antagonism issue or a dysfunctional issue in the family. And we're going to see where this dysfunction goes and what happens in the process. And I'll tell you, this one, let me ask you a question. Do you think Jacob was really a man of God during his early years? I don't no. think so. I don't think so. I think, you know, I mean, he probably mouthed some things about God. And, and I, I wonder about how how close Isaac was. I mean, I know he trusted God and God spoke to him. But I mean, you don't get the picture that Isaac was as dynamic an individual in his relationship with God like Abraham. Was. Abraham, man, I mean, now there is no question, right? I mean, he was an incredible man. But I'm not saying Isaac was a bad guy. I'm just saying he didn't have a real dynamic, you know, interaction with God. Yeah, he, God spoke to him sometimes, but not big time. We see God spoke to Rebecca. <laughs> it's like, hey, you know. So when we look at that kind of thing, we say, well, okay, maybe that's why Jacob and Esau turned out the way they did. Because remember, we talked last week that Jacob was a mama's boy and Esau was a daddy's boy. You know, and I mean, it was clear that Jacob and mama go together and Esau and Isaac go together. So we'll talk more about that and see what happens because of that kind of division in the family. That shouldn't have been a division, right? Should have been a unity, you know, for the family. Okay. Any questions on the introduction? Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are in control. And we give you all the honor and the glory. And we thank you for Jesus, your son, who came to die for each and every one on all of earth if they would just accept his, his free gift of grace of salvation. Lord, we thank you that you have given us this gift of grace and that we have been able, we have been given the honor of making you Lord of our lives. And so, Lord, help us to understand this scripture and, and give us insight as to how you are even fulfilling it today, not just then, but how your plan is being fulfilled and carried out. And we thank you that you are in control and you are sovereign, Lord God. Open our hearts and minds to understand your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let me go ahead and share out uh, where we're at. We're in chapter 27. Let me see here. Uh, why am I not on chapter 27? So don't pay any attention to this. Um, oh, now it should put me in the right place. Okay, so we're in chapter 27. We know that 
Esau has kind of already distanced himself from the family to some extent by marrying these, these Hittite women. And we know that that's going to go further. Oh, I think I mentioned that he married Ish, one of Ishmael's daughters, but that's late. Okay. Um, but right now he has two, two Hittite wives. And apparently these one, <laughs> this relationship has really made it difficult. Notice that it's not just to Rebecca that's having life bitter, but it's for both Isaac and Rebecca that this, these marriages that uh, Esau is having is causing on the family. So let's go into chapter 27 and look what it says. Now, oh, that happened. Remember when I read that earlier, it said that I, I mean, Esau was 40 years old, okay, when he had these two Hittite women. So remember that Rebecca had the twins when she was 40. That's when God opened her womb and she was able to have babies and she had twins. So that means 40 plus 40, that makes both of them probably in their 80s or right at their 80s, okay? But then we see that there's a gap here from the end of 26 into 27, because now Isaac's called old. Now, when, we're, when Isaac's called old, he's, he's a, most likely over 100 at this point. So there's probably about a 20-year gap here that's going on. So he says, when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son. And he answered, here I am. He said, behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons and your quiver and your bow and go out to the field and hunt game for me. And prepare for me a delicious food such as I love and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now, fundamentally, what Isaac is doing here is going to he's about to pass on the blessing. Now, this isn't the birthright. The birthright was the lion's share of what belonged within the Isaac family. That's the birthright. OK, so that is more a a money thing if you will or a power thing if you will in terms of possessions uh that's the birthright that now is jacob's okay because apparently it got back uh to their parents and that's accepted but when he talks about giving him the blessing this is god's you know uh, ordination as to what needs to follow. In other words, it has to do with the Abrahamic covenant. It has to do with the fact that God gave Isaac the covenant responsibility after Abraham died. It fell to him. But now when we look at this, what's going to happen here or what <laughs> Isaac think is going to happen here since he's blind, uh, he thinks that he, his son's going to go out and do what he's always wanted him to do. Be a daddy's boy. Okay, go out there, hunt for me. Go put one of these great meals that you know how to put together with the kind of game that you go hunt and bring it to me. Okay? So he wants, and I think the key issue here is this statement, this part of the statement that says, that my soul may bless you before I die. Because that is the key crucial issue. It's not so much that the son go out and kill game and bring it to his father, but it's about the blessing now. So look what happens. Who's listening in? Okay, the, I guess the walls have ears or the tent has ears or whatever. So look what happens. Now, Rebecca, who was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. Now, of course, you know, since they love each other, Rebecca's going to follow Esau's wishes, right? Not so much. Okay, remember I was telling you about the dysfunction in the family and mama's boy and daddy's boy? So let's see what Rebecca does. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, uh-oh. Now notice Isaac's nowhere to be found, right? Hey, hey, 
I heard your father speak to your brother, Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. So she says, now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare from them delicious food for your father such as he loves. Aha, uh-oh. We have we see subterfuge happening here, right? <laughs> In a sense, I don't totally blame Rebecca. Because, I mean, actually what she's doing is she's carrying out God's prophetic issue about Jacob, in essence. The younger, you know, is the one that's going to be the one that will be the one I over. I doubt thinking about that. <laughs> yeah. So, in a sense, she's doing that, but it just shows that God knows everything. And it's like, you know, it, he already knew that she, what she would do at the time she was going to do it. But, you know, from our perspective, we're like, woman, you messing with your husband like that. What's up with that? You know? <laughs> so, I mean, we see that this is being carried out because of what God said, in a sense. And so Rebecca's going to do this. Jacob is going to do whatever mama says. So he's out there grabbing these two goats, you know, and he's going to put together... I think the reason she had goats instead of sheep is that goats are more gamey. They taste more like, you know, wild beasts that you may get out in the forest than a lamb, which is less gamey or, or a cow, which is even less game. So I think that's why she picked goats over any of the other animals, you know, for her, for him to go bring in. So so he says, you shall bring to your father to eat, he may bless you, uh, and, and shall bring to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. Notice, she's got a plan, right? She's working on this plan, but she's saying, Jacob, let's do this quick before your brother goes out there, gets what he's got to get, gets back here, because we got to be done with this thing before Esau gets back. Now, notice they're not considering the feelings of Esau or what Esau may do because of going through with this subterfuge, right? Or this lie. So he says in verse 11, but Jacob said to Rebekah's mother, hey, have we considered all the issues here? Listen to this, mom. Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me. <laughs> And I shall be seen to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go bring them to me. So in other words, I, I think she's been thinking about this whole thing for a long time. And now the opportunity is finally here. I think she already had something in her mind of what needed to happen uh, if she was going to make this work. So, and I think God set the stage in such a way to where it could be worked. Okay. Because you would think that there's a lot of problems, not just the ones Jacob's bringing up, but there are other issues. I mean, Jacob's voice for one is not Esau's voice. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, granted his, his, his flesh was, would feel different you know than jacob's flesh uh with all you know considering esau had all the hair and i'm sure also esau stunk i mean i'm sure he was you know a very uh earthly man i guess you could say so i mean he's going to have a different kind of odor jacob would have been at home able to get cleaned up frequently and that kind of thing so, I mean, there's a lot of things that have to play in to try to, you know, get past Esau's senses that are working. Granted, his eyes don't work, so they got that going for him. But, hey, he still can hear. He still can smell, right? He still can feel. So let's see what happens. Verse 14, so he went and took them and brought them to his mother. He's talking about, the, they're talking about the goats. 
and his mother prepared delicious food such as his father loved. So just like his father told Esau to make food that I love, Rebecca's up to speed on what Esau's favorite is and the things that would normally fit within the construct of what Esau's expecting, or I mean, as Isaac's expecting Esau to bring. So she prepares this great meal. Uh, then Rebecca took the best garments of Esau. Notice that. So now we're getting to the, the smelly side, right? Took the best garments of Esau, which I'm sure smelled like the earth, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goat she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Now, that tells me, man, Esau must have been really, really hairy for a goat skin to be enough to sell Isaac, that that is Esau. I mean, have you ever, you know, petted a goat before? Probably not. Maybe so. I don't know. But they're they're very hairy. You know, I mean, their hair is very close cropped, not like a sheep that is more woolly. It, I mean, it is a very close crop kind of hair thing. So, I mean, we're talking about, I mean, if this is how Esau was, I mean, he was really a hairy guy. OK, so we see that she puts it on those places where he might touch him. Uh, in other words, the feeling side, so that, and now he's got the smell side, the feeling side, but what about his voice? Let's see. So uh, we see that Rebecca makes the meal the way Isaac loves it, the type that will sell him that it is Esau's, uh, puts the his clothes on him that smell like Esau. And then he also puts on him the the goat's hair so that when he touches him, he feels like Esau. So uh, here we go. So in verse 17, and she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son, Jacob. OK, so Jacob's going to go in now. Now, the issue is by getting there so quickly. I mean, you would think Esau would be saying, oh, wait a minute. How could you go out and get this game so fast and get all this into me so quickly? I mean, so there's another hiccup. Let's see how it gets handled. So he went into his father. I'm sorry. So he went into his father and said, uh, I wonder if he tried to mask his voice to some extent. <laughs> hey, my father. I don't know. But my father, he said. And this is Isaac response. Here I am. Who are you, my son? Now, see, I mean, if it had been uh, Esau, he would have known right off the bat, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like, wait a minute. There are some things that just aren't coming together here. For one, that voice is familiar to me, but wait a minute. What's going on? Who is it? What's going on? I need you to tell me who you are, right? So he said, who are you? But he says, my son, so I'm, He's thinking, Jacob. I, I really believe it's like uh, that voice is Jacob's voice. So, but he still says, so I think Jacob's trying to mask his voice. Oh, yeah, father. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father. Oh, now he's playing the role here. I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. Okay, is Esau, is Isaac sold yet? Let's see. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it, the game, so quickly, my son? He answered, oh, because the Lord your God granted me success. Oh, I don't know if Esau would have said that. You know, I, I just can't see Esau, you know, backing over onto God. So in a sense, uh, that's another strike against Jacob. But hey, we'll let it slide. Verse 21. Then Isaac said to Jacob, uh, please come near that 
I may heal you, my son, to know whether you are really my son, Esau, or not. He's not sold, right? He's like, hey, I'm being played here. So verse 22, so Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, well, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. Ah, apparently that was the selling factor, right? So Rebecca knew exactly what to do. Look at that, you know? So obviously he's gotten past all these issues that typically should have got him booted out of the tent, but hey, he's there. So look what he says. And just before verse 24, he says, so he blessed him. Now let's see the blessing. Okay, he said, are you really my son Esau? Now, is Jacob telling the truth here? Oh, he is. I am. Uh-huh. Right. He's not telling the truth. But, oh, well, so what? Right? We're already playing this game. We got to play it all the way out. Then he said, bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine. Yeah, I probably bought him five bottles, five bottles of it, right? <laughs> I want to make sure dad's well in a good mood to bless me, okay? And he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near and kiss me. Hey, he's still not sure. Come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And look what he does. His smell gate is working okay because he said, and Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, see, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. So he's a very earthy smell, okay? Now look at the blessing. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let peoples serve you. This is part of the covenant now. And nations bow down to you. Part of the Abrahamic covenant now being passed on. See, this is, it's not just, you know, hey, I'm proud of you. You're the man of the house now. You're good to go. No, there is depth in terms of what he's passing on. And this is a God-given establishment. Once it's out, and once it's on an individual, it can't be taken back, okay? This is the blessing. And we see Jacob do it later to his 12 sons. Remember, uh, as they were in Egypt, he does it for his 12 sons. Well, here, this one is being done to Isaac. And again, the, there's no take backs. Once this is out and in place, it has a God-ordained value that is in place. So he says, let people, this is verse 29, I've read some of it, let people serve you and nations bow down to you. And then wasn't that why God changed Abram to Abraham, the father of nations, right? And so we see that that's being passed on to Jacob. Be Lord over your brothers and may, ah, be Lord over your brothers. How many brothers does he have? One. one Esau right so I what he's talking about here he's talking about the descendants he's talking about all of the descendants in essence Jacob is foundational for the Jewish community that's what he's saying here when he's saying be Lord over your brother's Lord and who is that nation of Jews named after today Jacob Dude, Jacob. Yeah, and he gets renamed later after he wrestles with the angel of the Lord. He gets renamed to Israel, right? Mm -hmm. So we see that that is exactly what Isaac is doing here. He's passing on this blessing that is in place today under his own name. So in other words, the nation is named after Jacob. 
but with his God-given blessed name, Israel. Awesome, right? So he says, so be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. So this is the whole nation that's going to be that they are going to fundamentally uphold Israel, Jacob, as the one that is the Lord of their nation, in essence, the one that came about. Because remember, every time in the Old Testament they talk about him, they talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And I mean, Jacob being the pivotal one, Abraham being the foundational one, but Jacob being the pivotal one to where the nation came from because of his 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. So, cursed be everyone who curses you. That includes Esau, by the way. <laughs> and blessed be everyone who blesses you. So, I mean, that pretty much puts it in a very strict box. Either you're going to be my friend or you're going to be my enemy. Either you're going to be blessed by God if you are with me, or you're going to be cursed if you're against me. And that still applies today, too, through Israel, okay? So notice, it's not a real long blessing, but it covers the lion's share of what was in the Abrahamic covenant that's being passed on now to Jacob. So look what happens here in verse 30. As soon, I mean, we're talking about that Esau obviously made had good opportunity, got good game and everything. Even though Rebecca was fast and they did everything they needed to do, got Jacob in there. Jacob has to get out of town quickly here before Esau comes in and sees him with his father, right? So look what happens. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, well, I, I scarcely means he was beaten feet out of there, okay? He's like, it's done. I've got it. I'm out of here. <laughs> Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. Now, of course, from his hunting, he, he doesn't come immediately into his father. He got to make him the meal, right? Wasn't that what his dad sent him out to do? Not just to get the game, but to make him a stew of food that was pleasing to him, right? So he also prepared a delicious food. And after he had done all this, now Jacob's over with mom, I'm sure, like, hey, you better protect me, mom. <laughs> and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise. Oh, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. Hey, pretty much about the same thing Jacob said, right? And he said, his father Isaac said to him, now notice, he says, who are you? Notice he doesn't say, who are you, my son? Like he did to Jacob. Now all of a sudden he's confused, right? He's like, wait a minute. It can't be Esau, he was already in here with me. I was sure that was Esau. So he's saying, well, wait a minute, who are you? And he answered, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. Well, that subterfuge already took place. Now the truth is coming. How will the truth play out? Look at this. Isaac trembled very violently. In other words, would you say he's mad? Mm -hmm. I think he was like, I've been played big time, right? Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I eat it all before. <laughs> Excuse me a second here about the cop. Sorry about that. And he says, who, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me and I ate it all before you came and I have blessed him? Remember I was saying that the blessing is in place, no take backs, 
it's a done deal. That's what he's saying here. I was played and whoever came in, I blessed that person. Okay. Yes. And he shall be blessed. In other words, no take backs. It's a done deal. Whoever that was is the one that received the blessing that God had put on me and I passed on to him. Now, it fulfills what uh, the issue that God told Rebecca. Jacob has it all now, okay? Not only the birthright, but also the blessing. So what's Esau got now? I mean, other than egg on face, right? So what's going to happen? As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, oh, you know that everybody was hearing him wherever they were in the world, okay? He cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, even me also, oh, my father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully. There you go. He knows now. It's clear in his head. Your brother's the one that came deceitfully. And he has taken away your blessing. Now, Esau's not this peacemaking kind of guy. Okay. I mean, I'm sure that he, he really feels torqued about this whole thing. So Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? Because, hey, what does Jacob mean? A cheater, deceiver, conniver, okay? <laughs> and in essence, it's not just him. It's his mama too, right? She's the one that was doing all this conniving for him. But anyway, Jacob's the one that had to carry it out. I wonder why they would name him a, a name that means cheater <laughs> why would anybody name their son that? i think i think they did it because he was holding on to esau's heel uh, when he came out of the womb kind of like he's cheating he's trying to <laughs> you know use somebody else to his benefit okay that's the only thing i could ever <clears throat> think of as to why they would name him that way yeah yeah well, crazy plus, plus the lord already had told rebecca yeah well true. she was pregnant yeah, and yeah. maybe maybe that might have influenced it, too, that they were mm -hmm. thinking we have to cheat if we're going to get this kid to be the number one dude out of the two. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, good point. Good point. So so listen to what he says. For he has cheated me these two times. OK, so now he's considering that taking the birthright was a cheat. I don't think that was a cheat. I just think he was like, well. He blackmailed him into it, and Esau didn't care about it. If he cared about it, he wouldn't have given it to him, right? For a bowl of, of lentils, for heaven's sakes? Give me a break. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Then he said, have you not reserved for me a blessing, or have reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered and said to Esau, behold. I have made him Lord over you, right? And over nations, right? And all his brothers, I have given to him for servants. And with grain and wine, I have sustained him. In other words, he's turned over everything to him, the blessing, everything. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, oh, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then I think now his father's like, how do I get out of this one? You know, then his father, his, then Isaac, his father answered and said to him, oh, okay, you want a blessing? Here it is, dude. Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be. In other words, He's going to have to struggle to survive and away from the dew of heaven on high. In other words, God's not the one that's behind everything you're doing. 
it's because I mean, hey, where does dew from heaven, where does rain come from, where does fatness of the earth come from? It's it's God given. Okay, he says, by your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. In other words, here it is, you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. And we see that that's when Edom becomes a nation, that the Edomites, you know, become this separate nation. In other words, they're not under the Adamic family organization. They are a separate nation of their own. That's what he's talking about. And that's exactly what happened. He, they became a nation of their own. And unfortunately, this nation wasn't ever friendly with the Jewish people as a whole. You know, another one's the ones from Jacob's line. And he says, by your sword, you shall live. So there was fighting between Edom and Israel. And but still, until he broke free as this separate nation, uh, he was going to have to serve his brother. So we see that, that that was something that had to play out. In verse 41, now Esau, okay, here it is now, I, uh, still more family dysfunction. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Look what he has in his mind. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. So I'd say he's a bit tweaked. Okay. He's not happy with what Jacob has carried out. And now, granted, his mother played a big part, but it's Jacob who has the blessing. And Esau sees it as that should have been my blessing. Okay. And verse 42 But the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebecca. So somebody overheard Esau, and uh, you know, wh whoever he was talking to, or if he was just saying it aloud, you know, somewhere. And what'd she do? So she sat and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Almost sounds a bit like Cain and Abel. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh-oh. Now, therefore, my son, in other words, she's making more plans. Obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother, in Haran, and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Now, <laughs> I have to chuckle at this because it's like she blames it all on Jacob until his anger turns away from what you did to him. Notice she was just as much a part in this whole thing, but yet she blames Jacob in terms of what you have done to him. <laughs> you got to go away because man, you're the one that messed up. Okay. So, and then she continues, then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereft of you both in one day? Okay. In other words, if, you know, if, if Jacob was killed, maybe maybe she's thinking Esau, well, Esau would have to die too. You know, in other words, because he'd be guilty of that, right? Killing the son, you know, with the blessing and whatnot. I don't know. I don't fully understand why she said, why should be bereft of you both in one day? But I think she was thinking maybe they might kill each other or that there might be something else. But remember, Esau is waiting for his father's death first before he takes on himself this antagonistic issue against his brother. Okay, he doesn't want to do it before his dad dies. And I think that was a bit of concern. Remember, Esau, Esau was his dad, it was a daddy's boy. I think he thought that if I kill Jacob now, dad will surely die. And I don't want dad to die. Okay, I want dad to live. Yeah. So, yeah, you're back in, Janice. Okay. So, he says, why should I be bereft of you both in one day? Verse 46, then Rebecca said to Isaac, I loathe, now she's going in to talk to hubby, okay? I loathe my life 
because of the Hittite women. What she's talking about are at the end of the last chapter. Remember, that's who Esau married, those two Hittite women. He sa she says, I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. That means that they were living there with them. Okay, and obviously they're a pain in her backside or in her neck or whatever you want to say. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like these, one of these women of the land, what good will my life be in me? In other words, <laughs> I have enough of the hassle with these two women that Esau has brought in. We can't, we can't have another one of them in here. Otherwise, I'm going to give up my life. I'm done. Okay. And so, so we know that something has to happen. Something has to come into play if Jacob's going to survive for any amount of time. And we'll pick up on that next week when we see what happens. Okay, what does Rebecca do? How does she carry it out? And how does Esau take this matter? Um, do we even hear about Esau anymore? So we'll see what is going to happen there. But I think the biggest thing that we can take away from this is that God is totally in control. And he is the one who is doing everything. It is according to his plan, just like, you know, he's been with Abraham. He was with Isaac. And even though this one has more of a soap opera drama kind of thing playing out, what we see is that it's being carried out just as God's plan intended. Because guess what? What we already see is that Jacob isn't this model individual with this great, godly, righteous life. You know, I mean, he, I mean, look, his brother even, you know, had said it. Isn't he already basically a deceiver? You know, isn't he already somebody that that does things out of the norm? He's not, you know, this this model righteous individual. Yeah. So what he's saying is he's saying, hey, you know, I think God was saying, I need to get Jacob and I need to develop him. And I think that that was part of God's plan, as we saw when Rebecca was saying, I don't want you to marry any of these Hittite women or any of the women of this part of the land. I want you to go back and marry in the family line, just like Abraham did, just like you, Isaac, did with me, Rebecca. And I want Jacob to have somebody from our family as the one that he marries. And so we see that she figures, okay, hey, this is a double, this is a win-win thing. If I send him away, he's not in Esau's crosshairs, may, out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. And if I send him away also there to Haran, he can get a woman that I can live with it when he comes back. Because obviously, I'm already beside myself with these Hittite women that he saw married. So we see that there is kind of like something that has to work out here. Now think about this. Something has to get Jacob's attention to follow God. He's not at that point yet. He right now he's only obeying his parents. We don't get an uh we don't get a picture yet that God has introduced himself to Jacob. But in our next one, I think we're gonna see how God shows himself to Jacob. And we're also gonna see how Jacob's character is during his first uh interaction with the Lord. questionable okay and he wants to negotiate with god kind of thing i mean it's not the first time we've kind of seen abraham do it uh already and so you know i mean it won't be something out of the normal but we'll see that god is an amazing wonderful god and he is able to work through all of these things no matter how they come about and god's plan will be fulfilled so any, that's the lesson for tonight. Any questions, comments, agreements, disagreements, or something that you know that you might add? Nope. 
Good, good. Okay. Well, uh, then that's the lesson for tonight. Um, let me get to the prayer list here. I, I know Mary and Milton aren't here and some of the others uh, that, you know, normally contribute to the prayer list, but let's just go over it real quick. Let me end the recording here.